In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you how to make a restaurant quality fugger at home. It's simple, easy to make, and you can do it in less than half an hour using the blend method. There is, however, one caveat. You need to prepare the base for this recipe in advance. Have it there ready in your fridge so that on the day you decide to make this recipe, you simply need to take out that base and we're blending it with seasoning, spices, and aromatics. And just like that, you've got yourself a tasty fuga. This is a method I call the blend method, and it's one I use extensively here at the store. On any given day, I've got some kind of base simmering away in the background. Like right now, in my rationale for 11 behind me, I've got another batch of 24 hour bone broth just bubbling away. Now the recipe I'm about to show you is a variation on the one I do here at the store. I made it during the week, served it to real paying customers, and it's guaranteed to give you a restaurant quality fugger at home for your friends and loved ones. We've got a lot to get through, so let's jump straight into it. My name is Leighton, I'm a chef out of Brisbane, Australia, and I make for, for a living. And a very warm welcome to those joining the channel for the very first time. This is YouTube's only dedicated fur channel, which is a very good reason why you should be clicking that subscribe button. In terms of sales, you can never beat the fur bar. That's what most people come here for. But sometimes you get people who just want a simple chicken soup, which is why the fuga is the second highest selling dish in the store. People sometimes just want the lighter, cleaner taste that the fuga brings to the table. From a chef's perspective, I prefer cooking a fuga because it is a lot faster and simpler. No roasting of heavy bones, six hours versus 27 hours, a lot of time saved, energy, and price-wise, they're pretty much on par, which means bigger profits for me, cha-ching. But what this translates to at home for you is you can get this recipe done very quickly so that you can get on with your day. Before we get into the tutorial, I'm gonna break this video up into two main sections, creating the base and seasoning. These two areas I'm gonna spend most of my time on explaining, because this is where I differ from every other channel, every other recipe out there. I don't give you that BS line, season to taste, uh, you're on your own sort of thing. I'll give you my interpretation of how it should taste. And for all you nerds and geeks out there, I'll be using this meter in this tutorial. It is a bricks slash salt meter by a company called Otago. They're a Japanese company and they make all types of measuring equipment. And I actually had this meter sitting under my computer for a few months but I took it out specifically for this tutorial and I've got some scientific results which you're gonna find very interesting. Now I'm gonna introduce you to a term called BRICS, B-R-I-X. If you're new, it's okay because I am too. And it's a unit of measurement which measures the concentration of a liquid. This has been used extensively in Japanese restaurants, especially ramen stores, to measure consistency, especially in chain ramen store restaurants where you can get slight variations between stores. 
Now there's a bit of information on the Otago website and they summed it up very, very well in saying that the ultimate balance between concentration, which is bricks and salt content is the decisive factor in taste for all food. What does that mean? Well, basically, if you can get your concentration of your base, in this case for your pho, and you can get the seasoning or the salt percentage in that to align, when you get those two correct, you're guaranteed a great tasting result every single time. It is all about the base. Now, a little side story, when I was 17, first got my license, I drove mum's old bomb, Mitsubishi station wagon. The very first thing was change out the stereo. I brought a Kenwood doubled in CD player, amplifier and subwoofer. Yeah, look, I've the stereo, it's not bad, all right? I got it off a mate called Pablo down in Fairfield, which is a bad end of town in Western Sydney where I grew up. Pretty sure those things were hot off the back of a truck because they were going for cheap. But anyway, after I installed it, it was like a nightclub in there. When it comes to cooking a soup, it is all about the base. Your base is the foundation for your soup. In this case, a foie It needs to be strong, concentrated, and the stronger it is, and the less diluted down it is, the better chance you have of actually achieving your taste goals. Now, I want you to finish off this sentence for me. If the base for a beef butt is beef bones, what is the base for a chicken pho? Is it chicken bones? Right? Maybe. In Vietnamese cooking, it is not uncommon to mix up bones. They call it don sương. And I find a chicken base using chicken bones alone is weak. Uh, this is where pork comes into the mix. Before people jump on the comment section saying, uh, why are you adding pork bones? It's meant to be a chicken for recipe. I can't eat pork, I'm halal, whatever. If you can't, that's all right. Go back to any other fogea recipe out there, that's fine. But for the rest, stick around because this is a very important tip. Pork bones out of the three, out of chicken and beef bones, creates the sweetest base, which is why Vietnamese people in their domestic cooking use pork bones to create simple soups. Gang, which is the cornerstone of every meal, which right now, every second, there's probably a simple soup being cooked right around the world based off pork bones.
ok làm đi tải lên youtube And going over the ratio, it's roughly a 70-30 split between pork bones and chicken. Feel free to change it up, it's entirely up to you. And what I did was parboiled everything, put it in a pot, simmered for three hours. At the end, I strained it and I topped up the water to five liters, giving me a one to two. We started off with two and a half kilos of bones and we produce five liters, one to two. Now this is a variation on what I normally do. In my last tutorial, I taught a one to one ratio, which was even more concentrated. This time around, one to two, you're getting a bit more mileage without having to spend too much on bones, but at the cost of taste. So after three hours, having strained it, I had a look at that base, but I wasn't happy with it. It looked weak. So this is where I took out my bricks meter, took a reading and it came back 1.5. Wasn't happy with it. Next day came in, redid it, simmered it for another three hours using the same bones. Didn't throw it out taking the total simmer time to six hours. Strained it, took another reading, and I was blown away at the reading. Three bricks. As a disclaimer, I did reach out to Otago for some clarification, because I wasn't sure whether my measurements were accurate. Uh, they unfortunately haven't got back to me in time for this video. So the readings I'm giving you is what I got on the day. But if it turns out they're incorrect, I'll, I'll correct them in the description below. Still, I was not happy. Took out two boiler hens and made a concentrate over six hours. Took a reading, it shot through the roof at 5.5 bricks. This was a one to one. Two boiler hens, which is two kilos. And I produced two liters, so one to one. And we're gonna use this in case of an emergency or a spare tire, but we'll come back to that later. Another side story, when I first started making forget, I didn't know what I was doing and I made a big mistake. I went down to Woolies, I went to the deli section where they sold the chicken and I picked out the most expensive chicken I could find, thinking the more expensive, the better. It was an RSPCA slash organic chicken. Cost so much, it was like 25 bucks for this tiny little chicken. Brought it home, simmered it away for a few hours and completely failed. Not only was my base weak, but the chicken was thrashed, was overcooked. Vietnamese people call it nhu. And I learned a valuable lesson from that experience because what you don't want to do is use expensive chicken to create your base. You do the opposite. Get some boiler hens, which are available in most butchers and Asian supermarkets in the freezer section. Use it to create your base and throw it out after. You can also use chicken frames. And there was a point where butchers used to give these away for free. I'm not too sure whether they still do it or not. I even use chicken wingtips at one point. As I read, it has a lot of collagen. And if you want to take it up another level, add in mong heo or pig trotters. So that is hot tip number two, because you get a much sweeter result. 
So the story of how I came up with this adding pork bone technique, I actually have my ex-girlfriend to thank. She was the one who taught me this. And the story goes, I came over one night, she was cooking a fogat. It was one of the best fogat I ever had. I asked her, what did you put in it? And she smiled and said, I added pork bones. I was like, oh yeah. Next day, came in, ripped up my old fogat recipe, redid it, adding in pork bones, and the results are amazing. So I have her to thank, Gammon M, and so do you, because this is a very hot tip, and I really should be renaming this video as my ex-girlfriend's fogat recipe. When it comes to seasoning, a lot of different ways to do it. In my last tutorial, I made the mistake of specifying hat nem, which, as it turns out, no one in the States has access to. This time around, we're only going to use simple ingredients. Salt, rock sugar, fish sauce, MSG, nors, chicken powder. This is not essential, but it's just what I'm going to use in today's video. Now, personally, at the store, I season with Hatnam and what game. I was going to specify using this, but again, pretty sure no one has access to it. So it defeats the purpose of this video altogether because I want you guys to get the exact same results that I'm getting. Now, in terms of chicken powder, a lot of different types. These are the more expensive version, but they all do the same thing. That is, they produce a chicken flavor. Personally, in my line of work, I don't use chicken powder in my cooking. I just find chicken powder produces a fake taste. Workflow. When it comes to actually applying the blend method in real life, this is what it looks like. We've produced five liters of base. That's ready to go. And on that particular day, I decided to use only half of it. So I took out two and a half liters and put it into a pot. And two and a half liters might not be a lot for those watching with big families to feed, but for a couple or for those single people out there, that's five servings at 500 mils a bowl. And the other half of the base, just put it away in your fridge or freezer for another day. Or if you manage to stuff up this recipe, you can have another bite of the cherry straight away. And the way in which I season is an under over method. Again, this is a made up word, but think of it like a wave. I start off by adding in salt, approximately 35 grams. This will take things all the way down the deep end. And word of warning, it will taste like salt water, but don't panic. After this, I added in approximately 50 grams of rock sugar and three teaspoons of chicken powder. This part will vary depending on what type of chicken powder you're using. Different brands have different salt content, but either way, they all do the same thing. They give a slightly artificial chicken flavor slash boost. And the thing to remember is keep the chicken powder to a minimum because we don't want the artificial flavor overpowering the natural. And at this point, it will taste slightly sweet but right at the very end, we're gonna take it down with some fish sauce, approximately one to two teaspoons. Last but not least, I added in two teaspoons of MSG, which really elevates the taste. If you've done the hard work creating a solid base, this is where MSG will make a difference in your soup. And the trick is to add enough in to make the taste pop, but not to the point where you overdo it and people notice, e.g. Chinese restaurant syndrome. Have a taste of your broth now, two things can happen from here. You either got it right or you didn't, and you'll know. And for those who are happy with the taste, congratulations, but for those who still feel things aren't quite right, 
let's troubleshoot this. We're gonna play out a scenario. You spend all day nursing this stock pot to produce a pho. You come to taste it for the final time and it's still not tasting right. You're disappointed, frustrated, you don't know what's happened, where you went wrong. Let's troubleshoot this. Now, nine times out of 10, it's to do with the base. Something went wrong. A common question I get asked is, hey Leighton, I followed your recipe down to the T. I simmered it between 88 and 92. I even purchased a thermometer to make sure that it's correct, but I'm losing too much broth to evaporation. What is going on? Well, the simple solution to that is, it's like that Beyonce song. To the left, to the left. Turn that gas knob to the left and lower your temperature. To explain this even further, this is what you want to produce by the end, but you end up with something like this. How? Well, it's very simple. You're simmering away over, say, six hours. You go away, do some housework. You go outside, rake the leaves, come back in, walk past your stock pot, and realize half of it has evaporated. What's the first thing you do? You top it up with water, don't you? Now, repeat this two to three times over that period of cooking. And what do you end up with? A weak ass base, because that base is watery and weak. And the soup you're trying to produce off this base has no legs to stand on. Because by the time you season it, and you put the onion, the charred ginger, the spices, thinking it's gonna be you know, top notch, what you end up tasting is something that is bland and hollow. And this is why. But reason number two why you're losing so much of your base to evaporation is you're not getting that oil slick on top. This oil slows down the rate of evaporation. Like when I do my bone broth, there's this five inch thick slick of beef fat from the bone marrow. But when you come to chicken bones and pork bones, you'll find they do not produce much oil. So a quick fix to this, go grab some vegetable oil, pour a thick layer on top, and this will slow down that rate of evaporation. Think of it like a cheap insurance policy. You can skim it off right at the very end. Goodness. Yes, that is a flat tire. just woken up and let's just call this my morning morning workout if all else fails you've got yourself a spare tire treat this as a space saver because it comes in handy in case of an emergency and this is an essential skill I wish someone taught me because I'm gonna tell you a little side story which relates to a spare tire or my lack of knowledge on how to change one. The story goes like this. When I was 17, again, I was in mum's station wagon and my best friend Jason hooked up a date with these two white girls. And the plan was for me to pick them up. We're gonna have dinner and a movie down at Stockies or Stocklands. And as I drove over to her house, I think it was up in Bosley Park or somewhere, as soon as I pulled up in front of this big house, the left front tire was flat. And I got out, both Jason and I had no clue how to change it. The girls came out dressed very nicely, skirt, crop top, and I said to them, I'm sorry ladies, but I've got a flat tire and mum doesn't have NRMA roadside assist. Bummer, what do we do? 
one of the girls and she said, that's all right, I know how to change a tire. So she single-handedly changed the tire on my mum's car as Jason and I stood back and watched in disbelief. My masculinity, my balls, I shrank just watching this 17-year-old girl change the tire on my mum's car. At the end, I said to Jason, I'm sorry, I can't do this, let's get the fuck out of here. Because I felt so embarrassed, I didn't know how to change a tire, and yeah, we took off, never saw them again, but I regret that because I could have been with a white girl. That was one of my first opportunities that I blew. Yeah, nothing too old, bro. <laughs> Mate, they call it a nice dude young. You know that? <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice dude young, young bro. All else fails and you're still lacking flavor. What you do, add a shot of this concentrate in and just like that, you've got yourself an injection of flavor. Oh, that is good. That is very good. A neat little trick, try it out some time. Always have some kind of concentrate handy because you can use this for just about anything. If you haven't already noticed, I did something differently this time around. I deliberately left talking about the spices and the aromatics and charring the onion and ginger, getting it nice and brown. I left all that out to the very end because I wanted you to concentrate on getting the taste and the seasoning right. And in order to do that, you don't need the noise and the distraction that these two bring, which is why at the very end, once you've got your taste right, things happen very, very quickly. It's like dating in your late 30s, things happen very fast. Add all these in right at the very end and you can infuse it in as little as half an hour and straight after that, you can serve it. When it comes to spices, the rule that I follow for Fuga is I avoid cardamom and clove find these two do not go well with the flavor or the personality of a fogat. Stick to cinnamon, star anise, and coriander seed is okay as well. I find these three work well with the fogat. But one thing to keep in mind, keep it to a minimum. In terms of the onion and the ginger, it's really up to you. I used half an onion, tiny bit of ginger, and that was enough. There's a final rule I want you to remember, and that is the natural taste of the base should shine through each and every time as you're having a taste of that broth. So think of it like a race. There's first, second, and third. There's a podium. If this base was racing the spices, the aromatics, and everyone else, this guy needs to win the gold medal each and every time. You have no idea, no idea what I've been through over the past two weeks. It's been the busiest week of my life leading up to my holiday tomorrow. I fly out to Vietnam in the morning and I've been crazy enough to shoot this tutorial on Monday. Pulled some all-nighters just to get this video out of the way before I go. Yeah, I'll do a shorter version of this video when I get back. I've got two weeks in Vietnam, Thailand and Indonesia on the leg home. So much content. Can't wait to show you guys. But until then, stay safe. My name's Leighton. I'll see you in the next one.